A rare phone call amid heightened tensions, President Biden raising concerns to China's Xi Jinping over TikTok, Taiwan and China's hacking schemes. That's as new revelations are sounding alarms over Beijing's infiltration of U.S. infrastructure. Joining us now live from the White House is NTD's White House correspondent, Iris Tao. Good evening, Iris. So what are you hearing from the White House about the Biden Xi call today? Good evening to you, Steve. So it was the first time that President Biden and she talked after they last met in person back in November. Remember back then, Biden even called she a dictator after their in-person meeting in San Francisco. And this time around, the White House says the call lasted for about an hour and 45 minutes that the two had a candid conversation covering a range of issues that they both agreed and some disagreed on, among which the two talked about AI, climate change, and also maintaining open lines of communication but also the White House says Biden raised concerns about a range of issues. Here's what the White House was saying about a part of it. Watch. President Biden also emphasized the importance of maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait, and he reaffirmed the importance of the rule of law and freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. He raised concerns over the PRC's support for Russia's defense industrial base. And in addition to these, the White House says Biden also raised concerns about China's unfair trade practices, as well as the Chinese ownership of the app, app TikTok. And in addition, a senior administration official told us before the call that Biden is committed to raising concerns about China's cyber attacks targeting critical infrastructure in the U.S. And just last week, the U.S. indicted and sanctioned several Chinese hackers for allegedly launching a massive state-backed hacking operation targeting U.S and government officials, even campaign personnel and political candidates. And millions of Americans also have their data potentially compromised by these Chinese hackers. Notably, the White House today said this about what Biden raised to Xi about interfering with the U.S. in 2024 elections. Watch. We've been uh, uh, clear consistently, even going back to the November meeting in California, about our concerns over uh, our own election security um, and, and efforts by certain actors, including some from the PRC, to, to affect. Just earlier this month, the U.S. intelligence community warned that China may be trying to interfere with the 2024 elections here in the U.S., part of it through propaganda. And a senior administration official further told us yesterday that even if China says they won't do so, it's not enough. It's not likely that the U.S. will take them at their word. Steve. Well, Iris, it certainly seems like today's call highlighted how the concerns when it comes to China, uh, the communist Chinese are, are endless, especially given China's track record of trying to meddle with democratic institutions and so on. So with that said, Iris, what's next after today's call? Any upcoming action? Right, so there will be more engagements from both the U.S. and China. Senior administration officials such as Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen will travel to China in the next few days. Also, Secretary of State Antony Blinken will also be there in the coming weeks. And also next week, President Biden will host the leaders of Philippines and Japan here at the White House for a joint meeting during which the topic of China's influence will surely come up as a top topic. Steve. And today's Iris Tao live at the White House. Thank you, Iris. Gagged once again, former President Trump hit with a broader gag order in his so-called hush money case in New York. This after he commented against Judge Juan Marchand's daughter on social media. The judge previously issued an order barring Trump from making public statements about witnesses, prosecutors, jurors, and their family members. That order has now been amended to cover the judge's family members as well. Marchand's daughter is the president of a progressive political consulting firm, in a social media post last week, Trump calling her a, quote, rabid Trump hater who seeks to target him. Meanwhile, the former president has secured a $175 million bond in his civil fraud case in New York. This deal means Trump's assets won't be seized by authorities, which includes Trump Tower, during his appeal. It also sets aside a $454 million judgment issued by the court. Trump's attorneys previously argued that a bond covering the full amount would not be feasible. The former president faces 34 felony charges related to falsifying business records. He's pleaded not guilty to all. In turning our attention now to the 2024 presidential election, voters across four states are deciding who will secure each party's nomination. The primaries are taking place across Connecticut, New York, Rhode Island, and Wisconsin. 
The end result is already clear with President Biden and former President Trump each clinching their party's nomination. These states, except for Wisconsin, generally lean Democratic in presidential election years. The true frontrunners are waiting to pick up hundreds of additional delegates. They're up for grabs tonight. And former President Trump is campaigning in key swing states today. And NTD's Jack Bradley is in Green Bay, Wisconsin, where Trump is holding a rally this evening. Jack, what is the latest uh, in the Trump campaign? Hey, Steve, good evening to you. Well, uh, Trump is scheduled to speak here in Green Bay, Wisconsin at the KI Convention Center later this evening. Uh, it's primary day today in Wisconsin, and voters, uh, it's an open primary, so you don't have to register to a particular party to vote here. Um, but pretty much President Biden and Trump have this uh, in the bag. They don't really have any challengers here. Um, Biden and Trump, uh, you know, before this, Trump was in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, giving a speech on how illegal immigration has impacted people up here in the Great Lakes. And he said that, um, you know, talked about this latest outrage over this 25-year-old woman who was allegedly murdered by uh, a previously deported uh, Mexican national. Take a look. Beautiful young woman was savagely murdered by an illegal alien criminal under the Trump administration. This monster had been deported, thrown out of the country, wasn't going to be able to come back. President Biden took office in 2021 when he did. Um, he reversed many of Trump's border policies and offering a more welcoming approach. But as we've seen, record surges in illegal immigration at the southern border. According to a March poll by the Associated Press Nork Center for Public Affairs uh, Research, about two thirds of Americans now disapprove of Biden's handling at the southern border, along with four in 10 Democrats, 55 percent of black adults and 73 percent of Hispanics. Now, Mexico's president said that he will help aid and curb this surge at the southern border. Uh, as long as the U.S. makes some conditions, um, they need to provide, uh, lift these sanctions on Cuba and Venezuela, uh, send Amer Latin American and Caribbean countries $20 billion in aid every year and grant a legal status to some Mexican uh, immigrants here in the U.S. Now, Trump said that these demands show just a blatant lack of respect uh, toward the U.S. Take a look. Mexico is now asking for $20 billion a year to a year to even sit down and talk to these people. They wouldn't ask me for that. $20 billion a year. Have you seen that? I don't know, Mike Rogers. I think we're going to have to stop that. Now, on the other end of this, President Biden has blamed Congress for inaction at the southern border. Uh, and just yesterday, Biden, uh, the Biden campaign, rather, held a rally uh, targeting Trump, saying, uh, reminding voters about the January 6th Capitol breach. Now, Biden won Wisconsin in 2020 by just 0.6 percentage points. Uh, Trump won by a little bit a larger of a margin in 2016. And the results of the Wisconsin primaries will come out tonight around 8 p.m. Central uh, time. Um, Steve, back to you. A lot going on there, Jack. One thing to watch out for in Wisconsin is that uncommitted vote tonight. We saw that in neighboring Michigan. We'll be keeping an eye on that. NTD's Jack Bradley live in Wisconsin, where Trump is going to speak around 6 p.m. Uh, we'll be watching that. Thank you, Jack. And El Paso District Attorney Bill Hicks today said his office was prepared for Sunday's bond hearing of a group of illegal immigrants accused of participating in that border riot last month at the southern border. El Paso County Magistrate Judge Umberto Acosta ruling on Easter Sunday to release them. Joining me now to assess is attorney Brent Smith from Kinney County, Texas, to analyze the ruling and how it influences the flow of migrants coming to the United States. Brent Smith, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Brent, an El Paso judge on Sunday ordering the release of some of those illegal immigrants who were arrested for their alleged involvement in that border riot that we saw unfold right at the fence there, the wall um, that overwhelmed the National Guard troops. Was this a failure of the DA's office who knew about these mass arrests for Class B misdemeanors and was not prepared for a bond hearing? And does their unpreparedness indicate if, if indeed it was, was so, a lack of desire to prosecute them? You know, I believe looking at the facts of, of you know, when the arrests were, happened and the bonds that were initially set, to me, it looks more like the magistrate judge um, decided to do a political maneuver and grant PR bonds to all these people instead of, you know, granting a, a very brief reset to the state, the DA's office, to better prepare themselves. Um, 
and, and that's unfortunate because, you know, a PR bond is just releasing someone on their own personal recognizance. And, and they're usually given when someone has ties to the community, they're not a flight risk, um, they're a U.S. citizen, and it's a nonviolent crime. But in this case, none of those boxes can be checked, allowing someone to get a PR bond. So I think, unfortunately, what you have here is a political motivation on granting people a PR bond when they, when they shouldn't have, in my opinion. Brett, I have to say that video never seems to get old, uh, when, especially when you watch it and you start to think, you know, how quickly things can turn south. When you have that type of chaotic energy, um, armed troops at the border, um, you know, does this speak to the level of lawlessness at the southern border? It, it does, you know, and I think you can boil this all down to a simple concept. When you don't enforce the law, people don't tend to obey it. And so that's what we have here, it, whether it's, you know, any type of criminal action, illegal entry, or if it's, you know, robbing, robbing a store. If you don't enforce the law and actually prosecute those who break it, what incentive or deterrence is there for them to follow the law? So what we're seeing here is gonna be a message to everyone else coming to our borders that if you cross it legally and, you, you know, and you cause violence at the same time, there's no deterrence attached at all. So I think it, it sends out the wrong message for people on their way here. The judge released some of these illegal aliens on their own recognizance. Uh, what happens to these state criminal cases at this point if they're all returned to ICE custody for deportation proceedings? You know, um, you know, in Kenny County, where I'm at, we, we do have the same issue. And, um, you know, under the law, it's not an excuse to not show up for court unless they're still in DHS custody. Once they get released from DHS custody, if they fail to appear in court, a, a warrant will be issued for their arrest and they'll have that warrant sitting out there waiting in case they do get picked up in the States. But in many of these cases, if they're gonna be out of the country, then the prosecution can't go forward unless the defendant's present. And so I think that's why it's a crucial matter that these defendants are held responsible for their actions and not allowed to be sent back to whatever country they're from uh, or sent somewhere in the US. You know, We look at Lakin Riley's murderer, he also came through El Paso and was released. He was released into the United States though. Um, I don't think they're going to be released because a lot of them are Venezuelans and Venezuelan, Venezuela is not accepting any returns. So are they going to stay in ICE custody or be released into the U.S.? There's another caravan of about 2,000 migrants reportedly on its way through Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. This is the sister city to El Paso uh, to schedule appointments to enter the U.S. through one of those legal ports of entry. How does the border riot and the U.S. authorities' response to it influence the flow of migrants who are coming to the southern border? Well, it definitely sends the wrong message when people aren't prosecuted for breaking our laws. Um, you know, it encourages, you know, criminal behavior, quite frankly. Um, and, and Texas is going to have, um, you know, a surge on its hands in, in the coming days when this caravan arrives at the Texas border. But I believe Texas is well prepared to step up and protect its sovereignty. You know, we have our, our borders are Mike Banks, who has done, in my opinion, a great job at trying to secure our state. Brent Smith, really appreciate you joining. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Capitol Report. If you want to see our full broadcast, check us out at EpochTV.com.